Welcome to Church in the Home. What a joy it is to have you in our audience today. I tell you, we look week to week just to be able to know that you're there and that we are talking to you about Jesus. I pray that this is a good day for you. Our Lord is our healer, our deliverer. He is our help, our hope. He is our all in all. And that's grace. That's the best way to describe grace is that he's our all in all. And I trust it's that way with you today, wherever you are, that Christ is just manifesting himself to you and taking care of you and watching over you. And that you'll say when this day is over, it was a good day and I'll have a better one tomorrow. As you can tell, we're meeting in a different place right now. We're meeting at a hotel in downtown Dallas. And uh, I've been asked to teach the uh, senior, what do you call it, senior citizens? No, it's Dallas Bible class. Dallas Bible class. And uh, so I'm teaching that every Sunday morning. I'm here in Dallas and having a good time. And, and we're just going to all kinds of links to reach people with the message, and the message is going forward. Well, I want you to hear from Robbie today, whatever's on her heart, and may God bless her as she speaks to you. Well, we've made it through another month since we were with you last. Uh, we've been through new classrooms, um, new instructors, new subjects in our lives, and uh, I'm glad to tell you that we walk the same uh, roads that you walk, Many times ministries uh, portray that uh, they live different lives than what they would term the, the layman live. But uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, we all walk the same roads. Um, the classrooms change, the subjects change, the instructors change, and it's all to uh, conform us to the image of his dear son. And uh, that's working in us. The one thing that um, I was dwelling on in the last week is the fact that the Father doesn't force us to do anything. Um, I think people live their lives thinking that God um, turns it on and turns it off and, and that they don't have any responsibility in the issues of life, that kind of a case sera sera attitude that what will be will be. But um, I know we live by our choices. Um, the Father never took away the responsibility of our choices. Um, I've often thought that we make choices and that takes us down certain roads that we have to live out many times the rest of our lives. And uh, I do know God doesn't force us to do anything. He sets up circumstances in our lives. He lets us uh, live out our choices, hoping that that uh, brings us to a place of... Uh, of mellowing and, and uh, loving him enough to make the right choices. And uh, we love our family. This Christ Life family is very dear to us. Uh, we thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your love and support. Um, just as with you, the bills come in <laughs> every month. Wish they'd go away, don't you? But that's one thing in the Father's house, we're not going to have bills, we're not going to have the IRS checking us out, we're not going to have utility bills to pay and rent to pay. Um, but we're thankful for the Father's provisions for you. We pray for you and your families that the Father will open doors and, and make a way for you as you're trusting Him. And He does that for us and we really praise Him for it. Um, we covet your prayers for Life in the Sun magazine. Um, this constitutes the 50th year of our putting out uh, the Life in the Sun magazine. It was originally called the Life in the Spirit magazine, and years later we changed it to Life in the Sun. But uh, we're really having to uh, make some decisions on that magazine and how often we're going to be putting it out. Um, so we, we ask for your prayers and uh, and if you have an ex extra offering you like to send in, well, we won't turn it down. And uh, we just want you to know how much we're grateful and how much we appreciate our family. And thank you for making the journey with us. We certainly wouldn't want to make it alone. Bless you.
Thank you, Robbie, for that good word. And now, if you will, we're going to go right into the Bible study. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. <coughs> Presently, I'm dealing with six chapters in John's Gospel, chapters 12 through 17. It is my hope and prayer that you will see the relationship between each of these chapters, that each chapter has a very pertinent message in it from our Lord. Actually, all except the 12th chapter carries out the Lord's Paschal Discourse. Paschal Discourse. That means that he's giving his last message. He's talking about the final things that he would like for his disciples to know. The 12th chapter is on Palm Sunday where the Lord greets what could have been the largest crowd he ever had. And he says some important things there, and we've already been talking about the 12th chapter. We dealt with chapter 13 last Sunday, and today we go into chapter 14. The importance of these six chapters is that Jesus is tying up all the loose ends of his life on this earth. He came to do something special. He came to honor the Father primarily. He came to save souls. He came that the world might know that he was God's son. There were so many things that have to do with his coming to this earth that are pertinent and important to everything we could possibly think of. We miss most of those things. It never enters our mind about most of the things that Jesus came to show forth. For instance, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Or he would say, the only way you can possibly get to the Father is by me. These are things out of chapter 14. Or he would say to them that I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now out of this chapter 14, those words in the first six verses or so of this chapter carry out the aspect of him going to get a place for us to live throughout eternity. We know so many things about that that we don't know about. And we talk about so many things that we don't know and understand about all that. Like a city four square and the streets of gold and, and uh, a river that flows with milk and honey. Uh, all of these things, you see, we talk about just like that, the most important thing we know. But we really don't know a lot about it. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know how it's going to put it together. But it is a promise that he makes to us in this 14th chapter. He promises us that I go to prepare a place for you. Now he wants you to trust him. The closer we get to the end of the Lord's ministry on this earth, the more he changes from his, what I might call a hard message on faith to a simple message of trusting God. Big difference between those two ideas, you see. To get faith, he had already taught. You don't need much faith to get mountains moved and trees transplanted and so forth. He, he had great powerful words for somebody who was seeking after faith. But it finally reached the point to where he said it's not how much faith you have and how much you get. What is important that you keep trusting our Heavenly Father, that he's carrying it out. He's doing what he needs to do. He's operating what he knows is best for you. And so he brings us to a state of trust. Has that happened to you yet? Have you come to a place to where it's not how much good works you do. It's not how much you seek God. It's not how much you read your Bible. It's not how much you want God to do something big and important for you. You're coming to the place of trust. 
Always remember, trust is greater than anything else with the Father. Every father likes to know that his children trust him. That he doesn't have to go into all the details. That he doesn't have to go into uh, a whole quandary of things to get you to believe in him. Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Trust him. Put your trust in God. He's not told us all about it. Well, I don't know what religion you could get into that would tell you everything about it, that would give you all the little details, that would go through all of the People, uh, for instance, come to me and say, how old am I going to be when I get to heaven in a new body? Well, uh, I don't think of that at all until somebody reminds me by asking the question. I have no idea how old you're going to be. I personally think you'll probably be like you were when you left here, except with a perfect body, with a, with a body that knows no mishap, no sickness, no disease. I don't really know, you see. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it and talking about it. I trust him. I trust my Heavenly Father, and that's what, the longer you serve God, the more you need to trust him, because he hadn't given us the detail of every little thing that's going to happen to us. And so, we're dealing with Jesus in his last words to his apostles. <coughs> I think it is rather important that in John's gospel, when he comes to his final hours, his final days, he concentrates on 11 men. Judas, in the 13th chapter, has already been signified as the one who will betray him. So Judas is out. And they don't bring in another apostle till after the cross. So it's just 11 men that he has based his entire earthly journey on. Just 11. And so he's got important words for them. That's what we're studying. Basically here, we're studying the, the last and final words of Jesus that have to do with his journey on earth. Important that you know that because <coughs> it finally sits down to just one person. When you get out, <coughs> excuse me, I thought I was over this last week, but it only comes back when I get in this building. <laughs> when you get into the New Testament, you see a division taking place there. The Lord is dealing with everybody, giving everybody instructions. But when you get into John's Gospel, he especially sifts it down to just 11 persons that get the final message from Jesus. And then when you get over into the book of Romans and, and, per, and part of Acts, it sifts down again from 11 people to one person. Everything Jesus intended to have carried out will in the end of the New Testament sift down to just one person. And that's the Apostle Paul. He's not one of the twelve. He's not one who was a very special person. I'll do a lot of talking about him a little later on in this class. He was, in fact, the meanest man on earth. He was, he was a man who was given the mission of destroying every follower of Jesus of Nazareth he could get a hold of. But it was to that man, the meanest man on earth, that God gives the final message to. Nobody else gets it. It's sifted down to just one person. That's why the epistles are so important. 
I'll probably say this again and again, but you need to know that if you don't understand the epistles, you'll never get the message. You'll get bits, pieces, and parts of it, but you'll never get the message because it sifts down from 5,000 men in one crowd where Jesus spoke. It sifts down to 11 men and finally to just one man to get God's message while we're on this earth. And so, as we study these things, we learn two important factors. We first learn who Jesus is in us because the final gospel doesn't present a crowd or doesn't present a person who carries us into the unknown. It presents a person who is a gift to us. He is a gift to us. That the moment a sinner accepts Jesus as his personal Savior, he is carried into a whole different realm. It's no longer you seeking God from here to there. It's no longer you believing just what Jesus of Nazareth said. All of a sudden, the whole plan of God has come down to you and Jesus. Just Jesus and you. Because now Christ is not extended all the way to heaven. The moment you accepted Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit placed the God seed in you. And you can't get any closer to God than that seed. You can't get any more of God than there is in that seed. Being born again, Peter says, not of corruptible things, but of the incorruptible. So you have entered into a whole different realm and understanding. It is for this reason, I always tell people who become Christian, that the first study you need to make in this big glorious book is Paul's epistles, because that's the final stage. That's the final gospel. That's the place where you are right now. You are there. And so you need to concentrate on that. If you study Paul's epistles, you will see that he leads you into the gospels and why the four gospels are important. And the four Gospels are necessary to your understanding because the four Gospels lead you into the Old Testament. That's the way the Bible is put together. The last is in the New Testament. And then you go back to the beginning and see how it all came about, how it works. In this 14th chapter of John... I want to read the first six verses because they help to station us where we are right here and now. They begin with, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now that's a real interesting statement because everybody believed in God because Moses' message had concentrated on God himself. In the Old Testament, there is only a God. There is no son. There is no father. There's just God. The God who created the heavens and the earth is the way it all began. And so, he says, let your, don't let your heart be troubled. If you believed in God, believe in me. And he has made himself equal to God in that statement. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's very personal. You can take that personal. He right now is preparing a place for us. I haven't the slightest idea what it is. I grew up thinking apartments was... Uh, highfalutin place to live. Now then you've got all kinds of different buildings you can go live in if you got the money. 
He says, I'm preparing for you a place in my Father's house. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. And whether I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Here is his first promise to you and I. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Where are we headed? What is all this business of religion have to do with our personal life? Well, your first thought would be, he got me out of hell. I'm not going to go to hell. Whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. But that's not what God primarily wanted. That's something he did that was necessary because no sin or death shall enter heaven. But the big thing he was after was to get what he wanted from the beginning. Try to get this now because it's basic to the gospel message that Paul brings us. The heavenly father from before he created this world had only one intention in the creation of the world and that was to build him a family. That's what he wanted. He had this idea, I can create them, I can breathe into them a breath of life, I can give them the world. But they're not going to be mine until I birth them myself. That's what I, I'm going to have to do. And so he set up a plan that ended in the cross. There are two things that God did before he created this world that are written in this book. One, he chose us to be in Christ. He never intended that one of his children exist outside of Christ. He never intended that you go on your own personal way, do your own personal thing, live your own personal life, and work God into it. It was never in his intention. His intention always was to have a family of his own. To me, that's the primary thing God is doing. He's building his family. When Christ died on the cross, he introduced something that had never been known in this book. He introduced what we call pure grace. Pure grace. That in the end, he will get what he wants because he's full of mercy and grace. That's what he wants. He wants a family of his own. He wants children of his own. And he has done everything he could to make them his own. By the moment they got saved, he placed them in Christ. Now you probably sat here today thinking, well, I'm sitting in this hotel room. I'm sitting in this class. I'm in this place. But more so than that, You have been placed by God in a situation that he alone controls in Christ. That's why that's the most often used statement in the whole of the Bible. I know of no other statement that in a short period of scripture is used 146 times. You were placed in Christ. Now see, that's important to your understanding. He has gone, Jesus said, to prepare a place for you to live. That's the ultimate of God's plan, to have his children come to his house, to live in his house. We have never had that privilege on this earth. Some have lived in many different houses. Some have been most unhappy in every house they've lived in. That's a natural feeling. You weren't made to live in houses on this earth. You weren't made to exist on this earth. You are not a part of this earth. You're God's child headed to his house. The only reason you haven't gotten there yet 
is because he doesn't have the number of children he wants living in his house. Can you understand that? When Christ died on the cross, a big word erupted out of his death, and it was the word whosoever. You know what that word did? It cut down every person who thinks of himself and of his own life. He is something and somebody. No, sir. God has planned to have a life of his own. Your life. A life that is part of himself. So in my father's house are many mansions. And then he closes this idea about many mansions in the father's house with verse 6. That's one of our most popular memory verses. At least the first part of it is. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. There is no other. There is no other. Every once in a while, somebody says to me, well, isn't there somebody else? Isn't there somebody else that has the truth, that has the gospel? Don't you think everybody in religion has a little bit of the gospel? Absolutely not. They don't have any of the gospel without Christ. Christ is destined in the next few verses to say that the only way you can get to God is by me. Isn't that plain? That's plain. I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to read this chapter when you get home or in your Bible study. And I'd like you to mark every time in this chapter the word me. M-E is used. Me. Why does he use that word so often? Because me, him talking, him being himself, is the only way anybody's going to get there. There's no other way. Good works won't do it. That was forsaken before the cross. Keeping the law won't do it. That was killed out at the cross. The only way you're going to get it is... By me, Christ says. Me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way that you get there. It is me that's going to get you there. So get your mind fixed on it. You're not going to get there because you were first led by uh, Buddha or some other human god. You're not going to get there by some religion that is of a human person. You're going to get there only by Jesus. The only way to get there is by Christ who says, I am the way. And incidentally, you're going to find at least 18 times he says it's me. Two times he says, I am which was the same as using me, but he just used two other terms to stress how he's going to get us there. By he himself. How does he do that? The cross. He didn't go to the cross alone and bear our sins. He went to the cross with us inside of him. He went to the cross with us inside of him. He drank the cup, and in the cup was every one of our lives. Went into his body, and he fulfilled Peter and Isaiah's great prophecies where they said that he bore in his body our sins and transgressions. When he died, your sin died. That doesn't mean you're going to quit sinning, but it means they're dead to God. That's where you need to trust Him. Your sin that's in your body is dead to God, but it won't stop persecuting you 
until you accept Jesus as your Savior. You can't come to God any other way than through Jesus himself. So about 20 times in this chapter, you're going to get the message, me or I. That's important about this chapter. And you can read this chapter a hundred times and never get that if it isn't pointed out to you. That he's making a statement here that to get to the Father's house, you're going to have to come through me. So how do we get saved? We get saved by something that happened 2,000 years ago. If the cross isn't preached when you get saved, you may never understand your salvation. I didn't say you wouldn't be saved because God's grace is greater. But I said you may never understand your salvation. I've met so many people in my lifetime who didn't know that their new life started at the cross, that it was at the cross that they became a whole child of God, a whole person created by God. So your life started at the cross. It started when he died, you died. When he bore sin, he bore your sin. He got rid of your life of sin. Well, if you read on in the 14th chapter of John, you see other things taking place. Down in verse 10, he says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? And the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Would you believe that Jesus said that he never spoke words of his own? <coughs> that the words he actually spoke were from his Father? That he was never disjointed or separated in any form from his Father? If you see me, he said, you see the Father. The works that I do are not my works. They are the works of him that has sent me. He was never separated from the Father. Why? It's the Father's plan. It's the Father's plan. Jesus and his gospel fulfilled and completed the Father's plan. One day here, we're going to study something Paul said on three different occasions. The Apostle Paul said that the gospel I preach to you is a gospel that was given to me to give to you. It belongs to you and it was given to me to give to you. Where did he get that gospel? He got it from Jesus when he had these revelations of the final gospel. And Jesus was simply carrying out the message of the Father. This was the Father's message. This was his plan. This whole thing was a plan of God of which Jesus was an intricate part. He was very intricate, very important to the part. And that brings us to the next person that was important to this aspect of God carrying out his plan. There's another person in God. Let me explain it like this. God is made up of three distinctive personalities. Now, he's not psycho in any means, but he has three distinctive personalities. One personality is a father. Another personality is a son. 
And the third personality is the Holy Spirit. I was studying something this past week, and this writer startled me a little bit because the Holy Spirit is so common a term given to the third person of the Trinity that you would think that was his whole name. It wasn't. Many times he's called the Holy Ghost in the Scriptures. Only two times is the Holy Ghost ever called the Holy Spirit. Just two times. Well, when you read it, you probably say that this is the Holy Spirit. Lots of times people don't like the word ghost. But the facts are, the Holy Spirit is only called that two times in the whole of the Scripture. Another person in it. He gets introduced in this 14th chapter of John. And Jesus does it in a very, very powerful way. Two times in this 14th chapter, he makes the statement that in that day, 20th verse, John 14 and 20 says, In that day you shall know that I am in the Father and that you're in me and I in you. Ah, that's the introduction to a whole new world. You see, he's leaving. Probably the apostles are angry, mad, or are very sorrowful that he's going to leave because it doesn't make sense. He came to set up the kingdom. He obviously is not going to set up the kingdom. He's going back to the Father's house. But he says in this verse, I want you to know something. I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. You're in me, and I am in you. Oh, if you just can get a hold of that in your study, that you are never in a separated state from Christ. In this last message, Jesus brings, that's the most powerful thing he says. He says, when I leave here, I'm going to be in you, and you're going to be in me. You see, that's hard to understand. That's one of those things that you may never grip, get a hold of, until the Holy Spirit helps you. So now it becomes necessary in God's plan for you to begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit. In our lifetime, we have become powerful workers with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has become an intricate part of our life. But when Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit for the first time in these chapters, he was not going to be with us. He was going to be in us. He was not just going to give us power. He was going to cause us to know something. So go back to this 20th verse and circle the word no. No. Because the most important thing about the Holy Spirit is that we're coming into a different knowing. A different knowing. Four times in John 6, which is one of the most powerful chapters on salvation in the whole of the Scriptures, four times Paul says, know this, know this. He never let it escape him that it was what you knew that made the difference in your life as to who you are. Please get this now because this is the basis of Christianity. It's when you know who you are in Christ that you have become a full Christian. 
Not that you wasn't a full Christian to God. His grace was sufficient, and he saved you regardless of what you knew. But when you come to that knowing, as is dealt with so many times by the Apostle Paul, when you come to that knowing of who you are, that's what makes Christianity work in your life. That doesn't mean that God won't hear your prayers. It doesn't mean that God won't bless you when you serve Him. It doesn't mean that God won't honor you when you give some money. But it does mean you'll never come to complete fruition, a complete place in Christ until you come to the knowing. And so he says that knowing is connected with a person. That knowing is connected with the Holy Spirit. You're not going to come to that knowing by your study of books. You're not going to come to that knowing by your study of the Bible. You're not going to come to that knowing on your own. You're only going to come to that knowing by the Holy Spirit. And so now he has introduced the Holy Spirit. He has taken this third person of the Trinity and he's begun to talk about him. Tell what he's going to do. He's going to help you come to this knowing. The greatest power you have as a Christian is what you know about Christ. I told you I'd write that down. It's not what you know about eternity. It's not what you know about God the Father. He never made himself that important. But it's what you know about Jesus. You see, that's not an easy thing to come to because the majority of Christians are still worshiping Christ that lived in Nazareth and went back to heaven. But there's more to Christ than that. When he went back to heaven, God fixed it so that Christ became the incorruptible seed and everyone who accepted Christ was filled with that seed. Do you know about that? Have you come to the knowing that Christ in you is your hope of glory. Is that something you know about? Is that something that's ever worked in your life? When you pray, do you just say, oh, Jesus, help me. Come and help me. Give us a miracle. No, he's in you. He lives in you. He's not coming and going. This is in his final message now. This is the Paschal Discourse. This is Jesus explaining how Christians are to carry on. They wouldn't be called Christians until a little, bit, a little bit later on when the Apostle Paul gave the word Christian, Christ in us, to be our name over at Antioch. But that name was to brand us as somebody who knew something. You first learn who you are in Christ. Then next you learn who Christ is in you. It is a learning process that never stops. It was God's intention that Christ be our life. It was Paul saying, the life I now live is Christ. That was God's intention. He never intended that we get stuck along the way with some religion, some belief. I'll be the first to tell you if I get the chance that it isn't what you believe. It's in whom you believe. You know the difference there? When you talk to somebody about belief, do you tell them, well, I'll tell you how I see it. It doesn't matter. Well, I've studied this for years, and this is the way I look at the Scriptures doesn't matter. What matters do you know him? On that day, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, Jesus said, you'll know me. You'll know that I live in you. 
That's what Christianity is. That's who we are. We're Christians. And our process of growing into Christ, growing up into Christ, <coughs> is endless. Every event in your life is going to be tested first by God looking at you and saying, okay, first thing, first item, first important knowledge, where is Jesus? Where is he? Oh, he's right, seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes, that's so. But if any man, Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So what do we have in us? Jesus of Nazareth? No. We have in us the Spirit of Christ. That isn't the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us that. And we'll get more into that in the future lessons. But I want you to see when you talk to him, where is he? We had a little lady in one of our fellowships that became famous because when she got a hold of that aspect of the message and she'd talk or give her witness, she'd come up and pull her blouse or coat or whatever it was open right there and say, Jesus, I know where you are. You live in me. She got a hold of that. And we just got word from her this week. She's at death's door, 94 years old. But she knows where Jesus is. You know where he is? That's why it's so hard to get a hold of him sometimes. You don't know where he is. But on a day, one day, the day of Pentecost, you're going to know where he is. When the Holy Spirit teaches you, he'll teach you where Christ is. And you'll see that you'll never, never be alone. When you get a hold of that, Christianity is working in you. Amen? Let's quit right there. A glorious, wonderful crowd. Sometimes when I look in the faces of folk like you, I think that's the cloud of witnesses. Look at that glorious cloud. Up there. Wonderful group of people. God love you and God bless you. Been so good to have you here today. I like you so well. Would you bring somebody that looks just like you next week? Try it and see. Father, take what is vainly said, use it for your glory, and bless this people with he who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Grant this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's it, folks. That's all I can do. Thank you for an extra 15 minutes today.